welcome to today's expert webinar presented by Accountants World. Um, today's topic is three ways to become a more engaged accountant and leader, and our presenter will be Chester Elton, managing partner with The Culture Works. I want to welcome you to today's presentation and thank you for joining us. My name is Div Bansali. I'm a vice president with Accountants World. If you haven't used the GoToWebinar control panel recently, um, just a couple of quick tips on this. Uh, first of all, you can expand or contract or expand or hide the control panel by using the orange arrow. So if you're not seeing the control panel right now, you probably see a left-facing orange arrow and you can use that to expand it out. Audio, you can listen via your computer audio or you can choose to listen via phone. If you dial in, if you select phone call, um, you'll get a dial-in number as well as an access code and you can use that to follow along. If you haven't yet downloaded Chester's handouts, he has two handouts under the handouts tab, so you can download both of those PDFs and follow along with us today. And then finally, if you have any questions for Chester, um, simply click open the questions tab and then you can go ahead and type in a question there. We do offer one CP for today's webinar and that's based on active participation during the live presentation. Um, active participation is demonstrated by responding to all three poll questions during the webinar, as well as completing the survey that it will be at the end of the webinar. That survey launches after the webinar window is closed, and we'll also send a link to the survey by email afterwards, so if you don't see it post-webinar, don't worry about it, you'll get an email with another link to it. And then the last requirement is you must attend the live webinar for no less than 50 minutes. CP certificates will be typically emailed within two to three business days after eligibility has been determined. Today is the, I believe, fifth presentation in the 2017 Expert Webinar Series. Um, Accountants World puts together the Expert Webinar Series uh, annually, and this year's is the largest collection of talent uh, yet. And the goal is very simple. We're here to bring together some of the most innovative minds in business and accounting to help you move your practice forward. Our next expert webinar will be three weeks from today, Wednesday, July 12th, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern time. That'll be Tom Hood, who is the head of the Maryland Association of CPAs. And his topic will be the anticipatory CPA, how to get ahead and stay ahead. Now, I know many of you are already signed up for all of our expert webinar events throughout this year. Um, so if you're already signed up, you'll receive a reminder before Tom's event. If you have not signed up for Tom's event or any of the following events, simply go to awwebinars.com and you can sign up from there or go to accountantsforall.com and you'll see a link from there as well. A brief word about our sponsor today, Accountants World. Accountants World is the recognized pioneer in cloud computing solutions for accountants. We like to say that we've been doing cloud computing for longer than that term has existed. Accountants World has a mission to help accountants grow their practices by regaining control over accounting and payroll services. And so those are our two flagship products. Our accounting product is called Accounting Power. Our payroll solution, payroll processing solution is called Payroll Relief. Both have received the highest possible five-star rating from CPA Practice Advisor. And Accountants World is committed to always putting accountants first. We never compete with you by selling your services, by selling our products and services directly to your clients. We only sell to professional accountants and then allow you to brand those solutions for your clients' use as well. If you'd like to sign up for our accounting and payroll webinars, we offer those on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. Just visit accountantsworld.com and you'll see a link from there. Also wanted to mention a special webinar uh, that we're offering right now, which is called Forget Value Billing, Think Value Building, Five Ways to Build Sustainable Value. And in this webinar, you'll learn the challenges that accountants face right now and that I'm sure you face as well in terms of growing your revenue and profitability with accounting and other core services. We'll show you why those have become low margin commodities and we'll show you five tangible steps that you can take to break away from that traditional commoditization and make those services highly profitable again. So if you'd like to see the upcoming dates for those webinars, we have one coming up this week and then another one end of next week as well. Simply go to accountantsworld.com 
scroll down just a little bit and you'll see the value building uh, webinar link on there. So uh, I'd like to say a brief word about Chester Elton before I turn uh, the voice over to him. Chester is the managing partner of the Culture Works. He's one of today's most influential voices in workplace trends. Chester has spent over two decades helping clients to engage their employees to execute on strategy, vision, and values. Um, I've heard him speak before. His speaks, his uh, talks are provocative and uh, inspiring and always entertaining. And he's looking to provide real solutions to leaders like you, you who are looking to manage change and lead their workforce better. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and turn the floor over to our presenter today, Chester Elton. Great. Well, so thank you very much for that. Um, can you see my slides and everything? Are we good to go? I have uh, just turned it over to you, so yes, I can see your slides. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that uh, gracious introduction. It's, um, it's great to be working with the uh, accountants world. You know, um, I've known you guys for a little while now, and I'm honored to be a part of your leadership series. So hopefully over the next few minutes, we'll share some great best practices and give you guys some great tools to, uh, to take back to your team. Um, I'm also going to be joined on this call, by the way, by a good friend of mine and a partner in our business, Paul Yoko. I uh, find that it's always kind of fun to have these a little more interactive and conversational. We've got some polls. Paul and I are going to be talking. So, Paul, if you could just say hello and hi to the audience at home. Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, letting me tag along today, Chester. I'm uh, always excited to uh, to hear you speak, but even more excited when you when you actually let me participate as well. So it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, Paul, uh, you know, doesn't get to talk a lot at home, so this will be really fun for him. Anyway, um, <laughs> he needs to become a more engaged accountant and, and leader. You know, um, I want to talk, take you a little bit through the journey um, that we've gone through. When I say we, uh, my co-author Adrian Gossip and I have been looking at what creates a really engaged and productive workplace for, you know, just over 20 years now. And our work started um, in reward and recognition. We wrote a wonderful book called The Carrot Principle. Very simple premise, you know, when somebody does something great, you uh, you notice them, you celebrate it, and it reinforced all kinds of great behaviors. You know, we found nobody felt they got too much recognition at work. No one went home feeling overappreciated uh, by and large. And, and some great business indicators. You know, people stayed longer. They were more productive. They tend to be more engaged. Well, when we looked at what the drivers of engagement were, it became really interesting to us. Now, this was a... Uh, a, a survey database at the time of over 200,000 engagement surveys. And we said, what, what is it that really drives engagement? Also, by the way, a global uh, survey that was done by the Willis, Willis Towers Watson Group. And what we found really interesting is these three drivers were the top drivers across all uh, uh, genders, across all different parts of the world. But number one, it was this idea, do I have opportunity and a sense of well-being? In other words, do I have people that care about me at work? Do I have an opportunity to grow and develop? Number one driver uh, across the world. Second one was trust. And, you know, that's, that's pretty much table stakes, right? I don't know if any of you have ever worked for somebody you didn't trust, but uh, generally speaking, when, when trust is absent, things don't go very well. The third one was really interesting to us. It was pride, pride in the organization. In fact, one of the questions was uh, pride in the organizational symbol. When you saw your company logo, uh, were you proud to tell people where you worked? And not just what you did and how you did it, but, but why you did it. Now, this was really interesting to us. But what we thought would be even more uh, helpful is what are the drivers of those drivers? In other words, what drives pride in the organizational symbol and trust and so on? The number one uh, driver in pride was alignment. In other words, uh, we kept our promises. If we said we were going to deliver it on time, we did. If we said it was going to be this price, it, it was. Uh, trust was driven by communication. And uh, as uh, we, we go through the presentation, we've got some really interesting data in this ever-changing workplace where we've got multi-generational workforces and much more diversity than we've, we've ever seen in the workforce. This, this idea of how do we communicate. Um, so many different ways to do that, but that constant communication and transparency was really the driver of trust. Well, really fun was that the number one driver of the number one driver was recognition, or what we call the power of the carrot. Now, Adrian and I, you know, we do a lot of studies, we do a lot of surveys. 
you know, we do a lot of writing. I, I will admit I'm, I'm not nearly at good, as good at the numbers as pretty much everybody else on this call. <laughs> you know, we, we, we hired really smart PhDs to, to look at the data. And what we would say is, if we say this, is it true? Because, you know, I mean, I'm not a, a complete you neophyte know, when it comes to numbers. I did take a stats class uh, in university, you know, but I will admit that I was in the half of the class that made the upper half of the class possible. Sometimes the jokes are just for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing here. My, I'm laughing with you here. I think everybody's just on mute. That's, that's, they're laughing. They're, 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 they're virtually ha ha with us. Yeah, there you go. See, that, that was a little bit of recognition, a little feedback. Thank you, Paul. I, I already feel better about myself. Um, that served my purpose. There you go. But the idea about recognition, we said, you know, is it possible to have highly engaged employees if they don't feel valued and recognized? And the answer was no, uh, that it was almost statistically impossible. There's always an outlier, but almost statistically impossible. And interestingly enough, recognition was also the number two driver for um, trust and pride in the organization. Well, what this led us to was the idea around culture. Because while we saw some wonderful results from the recognition pieces, what we found is that if you didn't get the culture right, all the recognition in the world didn't matter. Isn't that interesting? If you don't get the culture right, the recognition doesn't matter. And that's what led us to write uh, the book All In. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that today. But, you know, hopefully there's some heads nodding there. The culture is such a differentiator in your business. You know, products and services can be commoditized, can be replicated, but culture, culture is a differentiator. Another big differentiator is leadership. You know, you can never have too many good leaders. And I've really found that when you boil it all down, if you've got great leaders and you've developed that highly engaged culture, you're going to have a competitive advantage, and it's one of the very few that, that are left. Well, as we took a look at the data and so on around building this model, this is what I think will be helpful for you here today. Now, we don't have time to go through everything, but the idea is, is that there's a transferable model. So I'm going to talk to you about a lot of interesting uh, people uh, and, and businesses and so on, right? Might not be in accounting, that's fine. Just think, what is the principle and how can I apply it uh, to my teams? Fair enough? Well, we're also going to talk about getting people in the right places, uh, doing the right things. Um, we wrote a book called What Motivates Me. We're going to talk to you about how you can actually participate in, and take some of our, our personality profiles. But the idea was get the culture right, get the right people in the right jobs with the right motivation, you know, doing what they're passionate about, and reinforcing those good behaviors with recognition. Your chances of success really, really go way up. Well, here's what's really interesting. The dilemma is that as we talk to senior leaders, and uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are going to be nodding your heads, uh, around this is that 90% of senior leaders recognize the value, oops, let me back up here just a sec, the value of employee engagement. 79% con considered it a key indicator of performance, but only 24% believed that their employees were engaged. So, let's come to our first poll. Um, like to have you answer A, B, or C. When was the last time you really considered yourself really excited at work? Are you currently excited? Was it the last six to 12 months, or was it more uh, than a year ago? And we'll give you um, a few minutes to, to answer those questions. But Paul, let pull you in here. Are you, are, you, are you currently excited in your job at the Culture Works? I am. I am quite excited. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering where the uh, – I wonder. this will be interesting because we've, we've asked this poll question before. We asked this in our training programs. And uh, we've got some funny videos that accompany it. But it's interesting how open people are willing to share, um, you know, where they are uh, currently in their current job. And it might be related to the company. It might be related to a boss. You know, all those factors kind of tie in together. But, but really, um, it's, it's interesting to see. And if I had to place a bet, well, I can actually see the, the real-time results here. But I think a lot of people are probably, you know, currently excited. But there's probably a good percentage of the group that, that isn't, and there's, there's definitely opportunity there. So 
Um, I think we've got a vast majority of the folks who have. Uh, uh, and uh, let me just uh, jump in. Let me just jump in yeah, for a minute here, if I could. Um, so just sure. a reminder to everybody: voting in all three of the poll questions is required in order to get CP today. So if you haven't voted yet. Uh, as Paul mentioned, most of the people have at this point, but if you haven't gotten your vote in, please select one of the three options and then make sure to click the submit button. Your vote won't be counted unless you click submit. Um, so we'll take just, uh, just about five to ten more seconds here to go ahead and uh, get the last votes in. Yeah. And the numbers are interesting. It, uh, it is fascinating. I'm, I'm eager to share this with you. All right. Going once, going twice, and we are closed. Right. And so here are the results up here. Forty-seven percent said currently excited. Okay. Now, so so Chester, so we've got we've got about half the audience here that hasn't been excited about their work in the last six months to more than a year. So <laughs> we've got a we've got a hopefully a captive audience here because I think what we're going to talk about down the road here is some ideas and some concepts and things that you can do to hopefully bring a little bit more passion to your work. So anything jump out at you from those, you Chester, just at first blush? Well, you know, it's interesting. You know, when, when we did all that work behind What Motivates Me, and, and you're very familiar with that, is, you know, our data showed that most people are in the jobs that they, that they want to be in. They're in the industry they want to be in. But that over half were not excited and not engaged in their work. So this pretty much mirrors our bigger uh, data pool, doesn't it? Absolutely. You know, and it's not like we're, we're not suggesting here that, oh, you should change careers or that all your life's work as an accountant is down the drain. It's just there's probably some things that you can do, which we'll talk about here today, that can bring a little bit more of what you're passionate about into the work that you do every day. Excellent. Well, so um, we have a wonderful database about and, and how we can divvy up, you know, who comes from where um, in 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 all walks of business. So we pulled out the data for, for accountants and financial employees, and we want to share that with you. Now, this data set is the largest data set we've ever had, 850,000 working adults, which, by the way, is way more of a sample than you absolutely need to, to, to be accurate within a few percentage points. And in, in our then motivators assessment, uh, which you take online. It's a personality assessment. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. We've had uh, now over 25,000 people complete that assessment, and that's where this information is coming from. So the top motivators for in finance and accounting. Um, the way this uh, personality assessment works is it takes you about 30, 40 minutes to take it. Uh, we determined there were 23 motivators in, in the workplace. And your top seven, when you take the assessment, it rank orders them, 1 to 23. The top seven are really strong. The middle seven are moderate. The bottom nine are what we call neutral. So we're going to take a look at the top motivators for finance and accounting people. And some of these might be interesting to you. The top five, uh, learning. Over 65% of uh, people in the industry that took the assessment had this in their top motivators. Uh, making an impact, in other words, making a difference. Uh, challenging work was also a high motivator. This idea of teamwork, that I'm not you know, here all by myself. I've got a team that supports me. I've got products and services like Accounts World that, that come in and support me. And then really interesting, developing others. Um, as, you know, as we look for uh, questions and so on, feel free to go ahead and type those in, and we'll uh, answer them uh, as we go through. But it's, it's interesting that um, when you normally think the, of finance, you think, okay, money's going to be a top motivator. That's going to be the top motivator, right? But isn't it interesting that in this work, learning, impact, challenge, teamwork, and developing others. Any, any, any surprises there for you, Paul? Is there anything there that jumped out that you were surprised by when you think of you know, our accountants and our financial advisors? Well, it's interesting because I know that, and we'll talk more about the, motiv the, the motivators as a whole, you know, but um, money's typically, money typically um, is not a top motivator. You would think that with finance and accounting folks that mo they'd be motivated by money, but that's not always the case. Um, I also, uh, you know, I also think that, um, that learning, 
you know, you think about learning, if that's a top motivator for an accountant, what are they doing, what are managers and organizations doing to help their or to help these accountants learn more and grow? You know, I think there's a stereotype that you know, accounting is, is, is a boring profession and you just you're in, in you know embedded in numbers all day long. And really what they're telling us here based on this data set is, is that they want to have opportunities to learn more, um, either whether that's in the world of accounting or elsewhere. So I think that, that was that was definitely something that surprised me was that learning was as high as it was. Yeah. And now take a look at the ones that are least motivated. Isn't that interesting? Money, prestige, and ownership. You know, those were so low on there. Now, I do want to qualify on the money part, okay, is that as we delved into that, that we're not saying that money isn't important to accountants or financial people. Clearly it is. And I always like to ask the question, how many of you out there have too much money? You know, let me know. I've still got kids in college. But the, the idea of money as a motivator, money is a very high satisfier. We all need to pay our bills and, you know, make our mortgage payments and and send our kids to college, but as far as being a motivator, which is really interesting. So you, you talk about, you know, engaging some of your people. Make sure that when you go to engage them and to motivate them, you're doing it in the right way. Um, a small cash bonus may not be as impactful as letting someone go attend a conference or to work on a, a, a team that's developing a new product or service. So those are kind of interesting things to keep in mind. And uh, this is all available in our, our PDFs and our slides as well. But I'm always fascinated at how low money does rank for most people, again, as far as a motivator. It's always a very high satisfier, and hopefully that makes sense. Well, let's get into yeah, this. So let me, let me, before, we, before we dive too deeply into the next steps here, there's a great question from John about do motivators really vary much by industry? And that's a question we get asked quite a bit, and the answer is, um, you really have to look at the individual. The idea of this motivators assessment is really to, to help managers kind of motivate to the individual. But if you look at industries as a whole, there are some differences. For example, in healthcare, you'll see motivators like, um, you know, empathy yeah. and family and things like that. Um, they do different for, differ slightly, but you might have three of the five top ones that are the same between certain industries. Um, they also vary by age group. They vary by, there's a number of different data sets that we can look at from a demographic perspective. So it's a great question, and, and uh, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, it is pretty fascinating to be able to look at that. Yeah, and like you say, depending on, and depending on your role in the industry, or if you're involved in sales, and most industries have some kind of a sales arm, uh, that's where money really does pop up very high. Money is a, is a key motivator to most salespeople, and, and what we find is in our data set that only about 10% of, uh, of the population so far find money to be a high motivator. But you know what? You want those 10% in sales. You want those 10% in areas where there is a financial reward. So, yeah, and hopefully as we explain a little bit more about the motivators, you'll, you'll see more about how they change in, uh, over time and so on. So let's jump into the three here. We want to be conscious of our time. Understanding individual motivators, developing your people, and then that high, once you understand that, how do you praise and recognize and reward them appropriately? So understanding uh, individuals' uh, motivators, really um, interesting work in here in that most engaged and energized people have aligned their work with their key motivators. In other words, they're in jobs that they are passionate about. They're in the industry they want to be in, but they're passionate about what they do. You know, we often ask the question, uh, how do you feel when the alarm clock goes off in the morning? You know, are you jumping out of bed and throwing your fist in the air and saying, yes, I get to go to work today? You know, are you hitting the snooze button? You know, all, all things that can happen, right? And, and key indicators as to how energized and engaged you really are. Well, um, people ask, so why another, you know, personality assessment, right? Um, many of you have probably taken a Myers-Briggs or, or, or the, the colors assessment and, and DISC and so on. That's the personality. That's, that's who you are. And I think that information is very, very helpful. Right? We, we need to know who we are. To thine own self be true, as Shakespeare would say. Um, strengths, maybe you've taken the strength finders or stand up. Um, you know, there's a couple out there. That's what you're good at. And the idea there is let's do more of what we're good at and engagement will go up. Where we saw the gap was I, I know who I am. I know what I'm good at. What am I passionate about? And this Venn diagram, if you get to that, that center section right there, I think that's when we're excited about work, 
you know, we're, we're, we're feeling good about our mission, our vision, the people we work with and for, and the people that we serve. And that's where we saw a gap, and that's why we came out with the uh, motivators assessment. Now, I mentioned to you earlier, um, one of the first things we need to determine was how many motivators, you know, are there uh, in the workplace. And it was interesting. As we took a look at it, we said, um, we love simplicity. Like, wouldn't it be great if there were just two or three key motivators that covered everybody? And the, quite frankly, we were kind of hoping for that. But people are more complicated than that. They really are. Um, and as we went through the alpha testing and the beta testing, we came up with 23 key motivators at work. Now, happy coincidence, there are also 23 strands in your DNA. That was not by design. That's just the way it came out. And you'll notice we stayed away from negative motivators like, you know, fear of death and, and revenge, um, uh, things like that. We figured those are things you should, you know, keep for your kids and your, and your family uh, at home. <laughs> but at any rate, those are the 23. Now, what we did find to help simplify, because 23 is a lot to keep track of, is that they kind of coalesced around what we call identities. And interesting enough there that um, you can see the, the five identities there, and then underneath are the motivators that coincide with that identity. And we tried to make them fairly intuitive. You know, you're an achiever, you're a builder, you're a caregiver, um, a, a thinker, or reward-driven, and you'll see the, the key motivators underneath there. Now, one of the things that I asked right away, I said, gosh, you know, there are uh, six motivators under the builders and only three under caregivers. Does that mean more people are likely to be builders than, than caregivers, you know, we we have a very sophisticated engine behind this, actually. It was built by the good folks over there, Vital Smarts, that, uh, that brought you the uh, emotional intelligence uh, 2.0. And so it's weighted. Um, the different um, motivators are weighted. Family has a much higher weight um, than, than some of the others. So just because there are more motivators under different identities, doesn't mean that there are, are more likely identities in the database. And hopefully that made sense to you. So knowing the, the motivators, we ask ourselves, so what does this mean to our teams? And now we're into our next poll question. Um, what percent of your team do you estimate are actively engaged? You know, less than 25%, 26 to 50%, or 51 to 75%? And we'll give you a few minutes to, uh, to Answer that. While we're typing in here, let me just add a little uh, color commentary here, Chester. You know, one of the things I found interesting is we've all taken assessments, whether they're personality or strength. And what we found is we work with a lot of people who, you know, just because you identify your strengths and you're, you, you know what you're good at or what you have a talent for, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you love. We all have talents and do things, but we don't necessarily love them. We're not passionate about them. And so as we talk to these companies, we found that, you know, they may have identified what they're good at, but they're still just not jumping out of bed in the morning. So that's where the engagement conversation kind of comes in. And when we talk about engagement, you know, engagement's not, it's not, uh, you know, in our training we talk about how it's not black and white. There's an engagement continuum, and we'll go a little bit more into this, but, you know, people aren't either 100% engaged or 0% engaged. There's a, there's a spectrum there and there's different levels of it so it'll be interesting to see what people think here as we talk about you know they think about their own team and and some people may not know you know a lot of people look at others and just assume they're lazy when in reality there's a whole set of other factors that are at play here so um i think our voting is we've got yeah we've got 95 so so go ahead so just a just a quick uh, so just a quick reminder here, uh, we'll take uh, five to ten more seconds here if anybody has not voted. And just a reminder, this is the second of the three poll questions that are required in order to earn CP today. So please get your vote in if you haven't yet. Going once, going twice. Okay, and the results are up now, gentlemen. Yeah, look at that. Okay. Uh, interesting feedback. Um, less than 25%, only 16% said that's great. You know, there's... We've got some engaged teams around there, uh, 26 to 50 percent. We had about almost a third. Again, another third, around 75 percent. Look at that, 25 percent. One in four said more than 76 percent, more than 75 percent. That is uh, that is excellent. You know, one of the things I think makes for a great workplace environment 
really is, do you enjoy the people that you work with, uh, that you work with and for? Is that, uh, is that there? Does that make sense? And uh, when we've got teammates that we can trust, teammates that we like to see, um, that's really helpful. Of course, the, the other part of the numbers here is we, as, we, as we go to the negative, is we've got 38.44% um, 40, um, less than half the team is engaged. That's a lot of opportunity lost. That's a lot of productivity uh, lost. So the question is, is so how do we then align our teams and, and get them engaged and, and figure out what it is they're passionate about? On this slide, uh, what we've done is we, we, we've taken a small team, just so it's easier to, to kind of navigate. A small team of uh, three people. And we say, okay, look, what are the top motivators for our three uh, members of the team? What are their bottom three? And then what are their identities? And one of the first things we look at is we say, what do we have that is unique, right? We don't want everybody thinking the same. You can see Monique. Friendship and fun is, is, is really high. Uh, Craig, impact and problem solving. And, and then you've got uh, Aaron there with you know, creativity and, and autonomy. Um, and so that's good. So you want to see, okay, that's great. We've, we've got some, some diversity. You know, the other thing you can take a look at here is you say, well, you know, what, what do we have that's in common? What is our, our common language? Do we have a few things that, that are common? And you'll see, Learning is very high for both Craig and Aaron. So you can add back to our, our uh, motivators in finance and, and accounting. Learning is very high. They're very good spots. Okay, now here's where the conversation gets interesting. We say, okay, where do we have what are called areas of caution? <laughs> in other words, where do we have disconnects? You can see Monique, fun is really high. Craig, fun is really low. Now what I would say about this is that that's only a problem if you don't know there's a disconnect there. As long as Craig knows that fun is high for, for Monique, he's happy to let her dress up like the Bride of Frankenstein, you know, during, you know, Halloween and take uh, four or five minutes at the beginning of every meeting and, and have some fun. As long as it doesn't stretch on too long and we can get our work done, that's fine. And as long as Monique knows that Craig has that, you know, doesn't like to engage in, in maybe the silly, she can take her few minutes, make sure it doesn't extend too long, and they can get along. But you can see that if they, if they haven't had that conversation, that can be a problem. You know, Craig's saying, look, are we ever going to get any work down here? And when he, all she ever does is plan for the next birthday celebration and, and bake the next cake. Um, so again, this kind of information can be really helpful. Take a look at this uh, disconnect. When he, empathy, very high. Aaron, very low. So who do you want working in the call center? with your key clients when they call up and they've got some questions about your products and services. Clearly, it's going to be Monique. You know, Aaron is going to say, read the manual and get back to me, right? So again, putting people in the right jobs that they're passionate about and, and putting them in a situation where they can succeed. This one's my favorite. Um, you know, number one cause of uh, broken relationships and divorces in America, they, disagreements on money. Uh, particularly in the accounting world, right? This is going to be important. Um, who do you want managing the money? Well, you want Erin. You know, she's going to be watching the pennies. Craig, not so much, right? He's going to be a, maybe, a, maybe a bit of a free spender. And again, Craig and Erin need to know that about each other to know there's a disconnect. Um, you know, a typical situation is, let, let's say you, you, you've got a project, you've got to bring in an outside vendor. Um, Craig may say, look, I just, I, I know people we've worked with before. Uh, I like him. Uh, let's go. I trust them that they'll give us a good price. Aaron's going to say, no way. We're putting it out to bed. Right? We're going to make sure. Um, Craig's going to say, look, we've worked with these guys before. They always give us a fair price. He says, you don't know that. You know, this was a very real-life situation um, in a project I was involved in. And finally, the compromise was, well, let's put it out to bid, get the best price, and if the guys we like can match it, we can go with them. But it's just a way of making sure everybody is comfortable with how we're handling the money and how we're spending the money. Does that make sense? Well, let's jump into number two here, uh, developing your people. And again, when we looked at uh, finance and, uh, and so on, that ranked very high. So old school is really interesting, is we treat everybody the same because that's fair, right? Um, that's our policy, everybody adheres to it. What we're finding in the new world is 
you've really got to know your people. Know their individual motivators. Know what it is that uh, the right way to trigger that, the right way to get them engaged at work. Um, I love this manager-employee partnership that we developed from the data. You know, as a leader, as the manager, you know, your responsibility is, look, I, I, to the employee, I'm going to listen to you. You know, my door is open, that open communication. I'm here to help you grow and develop. I'm going to share some feedback, right? Don't, don't take offense. You know, I, I need to be able to coach you up where I think you're, you're going to need some more training or, or, or some more experience. Let's identify the resources we need. And let's take a balanced approach. In other words, I may not be able to get you all the resources you need right away. However, I'm going to do my best to do that. And then on the employee side, make sure that you're sharing those aspirations, right? That um, your leader and your management knows where do you want to be in three to four years? How do you want to grow and develop and, and, and seek that growth? Be willing to embrace that feedback. You know, um, so many times people say, well, you know, uh, there's negative feedback and, and there's positive feedback. I, I think there, you know, if you've got a good relationship, it's just feedback. And it's all around how do we make our teams better, how do we make ourselves better. And again, helping your managers to identify the key resources you need. And again, a balanced approach, understanding that you can't always get everything immediately. And you can't, you know, as the old rock song goes, you can't always get what you want. But uh, if you're lucky, you know, you get what you need. So here we go, engaging leaders. Um, this, these were the attributes that we found were, were very common, that they have genuine care and concern. In other words, they know their people as far as their professional capabilities and so on, but they do know them well enough to, to know a little bit about their family situation, maybe their hobbies, and some of the things that they are involved with after work, whether it be their church or a charity or, or where they volunteer, right? They care about performance as much as they do their people. In other words, we're going to help you grow and develop. At the end of the day, though, we have to deliver. We have to deliver. And again, I've tailored you know, my approach in how I engage you by learning what your motivators are, learning what it is you're passionate about. I thought those three key things we found evident in every engaging leader uh, that we looked at without exception. So hopefully that's helpful for you as you look at the way you manage and, and, and the way you lead. So an example of that, uh, Jane Hutchison, this is a, a TD Bank. She's a manager at TD Bank. Um, you know, doing those semi-annual reviews and so on and uh, talking about her people individually, how they're doing a good job and where they can improve. She started to ask uh, some, some more probing questions to get into, you know, the motivators. And one of her employees, and to, so that we don't disclose any confidential information, we're just going to call him Bob, uh, was talking to Bob, solid performer, not, not a superstar, not somebody that she was worried that she might have to, you know, uh, take some uh, action on. Good, solid performer. Started to talk to him about it. Said, hey, tell me a little bit about some of the things that get you excited, you know, that you do after work. Well, he was a member of Toastmasters. He says, you know what, I love public speaking. Now, in his particular role, Bob never had the opportunity to do that. So after this, you know, um, work review, um, Jane started to think about that a little bit. And she thought, how can we better leverage that. Clearly something he's pretty passionate about. And then she came up with this idea. She said, you know, we've got these um, uh, work affairs that we go to at the universities and the colleges to encourage people to intern at the bank and to, and to choose, you know, finance uh, as a career. She approached Bob and she said, you know, tell you what, would you like to man the booth? And as a sponsor, you know, we, we, we get, you know, 15 minutes in front of the, uh, in front of the crowd. You can deliver um, a message about TD Bank, what is our culture, what we do and how we do it, would you be interested? Well, said, I mean, he lit up. You know, now this was an extra responsibility that she was giving him, but because he's so passionate, embraced it like crazy. Well, he had so much fun doing it um, and, and, and reporting back to Jane and, you know, getting, you know, students to sign up and, and, and people involved in, in finance. What Jane said that really stuck with us was she said, you know, not only was it exciting and engaging for him to go do that after work, but what we found was because that was so engaging for him, other parts of his work picked up as well. He was more cheerful at work. He was better about sharing best practices. He was better about, you know, representing the mission, vision, and value because of that one conversation where she asked, what is it that really impassions you? What is it that really 
motivates you, change the whole dynamic uh, for his career. So are you asking the right questions? Are you getting to know your people? Um, what are they passionate about? What do they do after work? Because as you start to identify those things, you know, you may think, look, I've, I've got a real thinker on my hand when really, you know, their, their family is a high priority, they, they have fun at work, they've got high empathy for customers and so on. Are you aligning those motivators with, with their responsibilities and perhaps even giving them responsibilities over and above where they can engage their passions? Does that all make sense? Have we, have we got any uh, other questions that have popped up there, Paul, that we can take a break on, or should we plow for? Excuse me, just a, just a quick comment, you know. I, I love this idea of really the, the whole team thing. We've seen this so many times where a team, has, they've taken the assessment, and we'll hear feedback like, oh, wow, that really nailed me, or wow, I didn't know that about myself. But where it's really eye-opening, where I love to see it is when a team does it, and then they create these team reports, and you can start to see where everybody's motivators are kind of side by side. And you see people start looking at each other and going, oh, okay, that makes sense. Oh, now I understand that. But then they start to act differently around those people in a good way. And it kind of becomes the language of the team in that they start to, um, you know, for example, if you have a team member who you know that is really driven by recognition, the rest of the team will go out of their way to recognize them just because they know that that's what, that's what they're motivated by. They live for that sort of stuff. And so it's really cool to kind of see how this can start to be embedded in a team. And um, so anyway, just a, just a couple comments along that line. I also, I, I love the story of how this manager has, has found opportunities to take somebody's motivators and infuse a little bit of that into the work they do. It reminds me of a story. We worked with a call center manager who had his team of 30 go through the motivators assessment. and. Four of his people came back with variety as their number one motivator. And he was petrified because he said, hey, look, I've got these people taking inbound calls doing a, the same repetitive job every day, and variety is their number one motivator. And, you know, he, he was afraid they were going to leave and there was going to be, you know, turnover, which there's already high turnover in call center environments. And what we said, we said, look a little deeper. Three out of these four people also had developing others as a top motivator. So we said, well, do you hire new employees? And who trains these new employees? We're able to give these pe these some of these call center reps an opportunity to be mentors and trainers to these new employees, which A, added variety to what they were doing and allowed them to develop others. And they were more passionate about the work that they did. They viewed their jobs in a different way than they had before um, than just a monotonous call center job. So I think that's kind of a nice summary there of what you're you're talking about uh, here, Chester. And so anyway. Yeah. You know, that's, I, I, that's what, all I get. No, what you're talking about is the more you understand people, the more you develop better channels for communication. And I think really that's the key to any uh, engaged workplace. And when we talk to each other, does it does it make sense? Are we communicating effectively? Well, it brings us yeah. to our, our third. And you've talked about it. You know, um, how do you when you see this great behavior and you have some success, um, how do we how do we reward and recognize that? You know, um, it's really interesting. Gallup survey, right? Employees. And I love this quote, employees who don't feel rewarded in their work are twice as likely to leave within a year. In other words, I just really don't feel like my manager cares about me. I work hard. Nobody ever seems to notice. You know, we talk about a highly engaged workplace. We say it's where people believe what they do matters and they make a difference. And when they make a difference, somebody noticed it and celebrated it. And I think that's such a great uh, definition. Brings us to our last poll question. How many of your employees have left your team or your organization within the last year? Now, you know, with the new generations coming up where they say, look, you just don't stay very long, I'm always curious about the answer to this question. How many people have left your team or your organization within the last year? None? One, two to five, or more than five? And let's see what kind of answer and this, could, this could be, uh, And this could be a topic unto itself, Chester. You know, when we talk to a lot of managers, they're, some are almost afraid to have their people take the motivators assessment because they feel like, oh, they're going to discover something and, th 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 and then they're going to see that something's lacking and they're going to leave. And the, the reality is that couldn't be further from the truth. It's an opportunity to, to show, if it's done correctly, it's actually a talent retention tool. So, you know, and the other, the other, the other side of this coin is 
when, when somebody leaves, you're, you're oftentimes not getting the full picture. Uh, I mean, nobody goes into a job on day one thinking, I'm going to do a bad job today or I'm going to phone it in. Um, but over time, things happen and people lose interest. So, um, so, so yeah, Paul, it would be interesting to see. Yeah, let me ask you, um, why did you leave your last job? <laughs> How much? We don't have enough time <laughs> on this on this call today. But no, there was a number of things. And as I looked at my motivators, there was a lot of things that were frankly out of alignment. Um, I wasn't, you know, challenged as a top motivator. I wasn't being challenged. I wasn't giving opportunities to learn. Um, uh, ownership is a big, uh, big uh, motivator for me. I didn't have a sense of ownership. Um, I didn't feel like what I was doing was making an impact. So there was a number of different factors that, that played into it. But when you look purely at motivators, that's um, that was a there was a lot of misalignment for sure. Absolutely, so, and, we're, and we're glad you did leave, Paul, because you're working for us now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. Yeah, I think so, we're pretty um, much on the polling. Should we give them the results? Uh, so let's uh, let's give just a few more seconds here. We've uh, we've got about four percent of people who have not yet voted. So if you're still on, please go ahead and get those votes in here. We'll take about five more seconds. And remember, you have to click the submit button. And this is the third polling question that's required for CP credit. All right, there we go. So we are just about there. And I'll go ahead and close it now. Okay, so 47% uh, had none, and then a pretty even split between one and two to five. Yeah, and um, uh, less than 10% had more than five uh, leads. You know, uh, that, that speaks pretty well, I think, of the audience we've got here. And, you know, isn't it interesting, Paul, that um, when it comes to this topic, um, the people that want to know more about it are the people that kind of do it pretty well already. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I always laugh when I go to a conference and, you know, we, we usually have something around, look, are you recognizing and rewarding people appropriately? And people will come up and say, you've got to talk to my boss. You've got to talk to my boss. My boss has no clue how to do this. And I said, you know what? Your boss doesn't get it, and they're never going to get it. I really apologize, you know. And yet the people that do get it, and clearly about half of our people here are doing a great job of not losing anybody, they get it, and you know what? They want to know more. So let's get into it. Yeah, and I would... And, and those 8% there that have lost five or more, that's an interesting conversation in and of itself was, you know, sometimes there's things that happen that are outside people's control. Companies get acquired. But, you know, I'll be, I'll be willing to bet that in a lot of cases, people just don't feel appreciated or that the work that they're doing is making a difference or uh, is meaningful or impactful. And so, you know, depending on if you have thousands of employees on what is, quote, unquote, your team, maybe losing five in a year isn't that big a deal. But, you know, if you have a team of 10 and you lose five, that's pretty significant, you know. And there's been studies, we won't go into it here, about the actual cost and the impact of losing an employee, um, what, that really, what that really looks like in terms of hard dollars. So, anyway, go ahead, Chester. Great. Raising effort because you want people to try again, right, even though you might not get the results you want. But then when you get the results you want, you want to reward results. So really interesting. You can just kind of jot this down. We, we, we found a, a study. There was a survey done of over 10,000 people. And they were asked this question, do you know how to ride a bike? Well, out of 10,000 people, only three people responded, I do not know how to ride a bike. It was really funny. I was doing this at a, at a financial conference, actually, in Rome, Italy, uh, not too long ago. And I called out to the audience. They said, you know, give me a number, not a percentage. How many people you think said, I do not know how to ride a bike? And uh, a guy said, 100. And I said, that's high. The next guy said, 200. <laughs> I said, yes, that would also be high. It's probably why there's a banking crisis uh, in Europe. <laughs> My point is, is only three. And, and, and that wasn't really what the survey wanted to get to. What they wanted to get to is, how did you learn how to write a bike? And if you remember, you know, your mom or your dad, your, your cousins or an older brother or sister, they put you on a bike. And they're, and they're encouraging you. What they're doing is they're praising effort. They're saying, hey, you, you know, you, you're doing great. You're doing great. You, you went further than the last time. Hey, you missed the curve. Hey, that doesn't look like it'll need stitches. You know, I mean, they're giving you that verbal praise. Even though you, you're maybe falling off and you're getting back on, they want you to try again. That praising, that is encouragement. That's developing. That's teaching, right? That's practice. And then, of course, when you get the results you want, you reward those results. I often say, look, if you're a musician or an athlete, you get this perfectly. 
praising effort is the practice, rewarding, that's the play. The more you practice, the better you play, the better you play, the better your odds of winning. And isn't it interesting that, you know, when it comes to championships, we understand that right away. And I know sports is a metaphor that's maybe overused, but, but I really like this one. You know, that's the World Cup trophy. You can argue the most prestigious trophy in all the sports. You know, four years to qualify, whole countries shut down to, to watch their, their teams play. And yet, I, I don't think this trophy in and of itself is the best trophy in all the sports. I think, without question, this <laughs> trophy. Now, I'm Canadian. For those of you that are Canadian in the audience, you will agree with me. That is the greatest trophy in all of sports. And the biggest difference, I think, is that while the World Cup is, is, is this beautiful gold trophy, very prestigious and so on, I love the specificity of the Lord Stanley's Cup. They etch your name on the trophy. We come back to do you know your motivators? Are you specific? Have you tailored the experience to, 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 to that effort and, and, and all that sacrifice? You know, in, in Canada, there's one religion. It's hockey. <laughs> and if you've played hockey your whole life and you get your name etched on Lord Stanley's Cup, you, you, you become immortal. That tailoring, that specificity, I think, is, is, is so important. Well, we want to leave some time for some um, wrap-up and some questions here. But we've talked about three areas there. Do you understand individual motivators of your people? Have you got a plan on how to develop them and, and, and craft those and what we call sculpt their jobs to, 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 to get them where they're really passionate? Remember the story from TV. And then when you get those results, are you rewarding? Are you uh, reinforcing that behavior in a way that, that's meaningful to them, that really does get to that emotion? When recognition is done right, I think it's the underpinning of great cultures. You get the culture right, you get the people in the right jobs, you reward and recognize them in ways that are appropriate, you're going to have a high-performance culture. Um, of all the stats that we've looked at, and Paul knows this is by far my favorite, you know, if you're engaged at work, if you're happy at work, you're 150% more likely to be happier in your life overall. Let's face it, we've all had those jobs where we were miserable. And when we came home, we shared that misery with every member of our family, didn't we? And the reverse is also true. We come back, we talk about, hey, we hired this new guy, and he's great. Hey, we're involved in this great new project. I think as leaders, we have a responsibility to, to send our people home happy. Well, I always say, look, don't forget to take this home. This is a, a picture of my growing and morphing family. That creepy head in the background is my son, Garrett. He couldn't make it to the, to the gathering, so we took a big picture. I know that looks a little daunting. Um, my oldest son is married. That's our first grandson there. I know that doesn't look like a real baby, but he really is a cutie. He's, uh, he's a long-suffering Jets fan, just like his dad. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, we learn all these great things at work, and sometimes we, we forget to take them home and apply them to our families and the people that really mean more to us than, than, than anything. So I'm going to turn the time over to, to Paul now. We've got some fun offers for you. You've been so gracious to invite us to, to present. I hope there were some good takeaways for you. And, uh, and Paul, I'll turn it over to you to, to talk about some fun offers and, and tools that these guys might use to engage their people in their workplaces. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, thanks, Chester. And uh, always, always, I, I've, you know, I live this stuff with you day to day, but I always feel like I get something new uh, every time. Um, uh, out of it and really you know it's kind of the why 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 do we do what we do and and so um, we're excited to have partnered with uh, with uh, accounts world on this web uh, on this webcast today and we'd love for you you know as you if you've gone through you might be asking yourself gee I wonder what my motivators are I wonder what the motivators of my team members are so we're excited to give you the opportunity to take the assessment for yourself and and share those results with your team or with the manager or with the boss and and you know, see how it lines up with your the other assessments that you may have taken. So, if you want to just jump to the next slide here, Chester. So we've got um, we we've, we've we've made arrangements. So normally the assessment is uh, is is forty dollars, but if you go to cultureworks.com/motivators and use the discount code account, it's limited in space. Um, you can take it for a discount. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll if you have any other questions about it. You can certainly reach out to us, and uh, and we've made arrangements with Accountants Worlds to to help um, facilitate that. So, I, again, we know that it's real easy to get bogged down in the day to day and deadlines and getting things done, but 
it's it's really quite eye-opening to, to kind of find out what our passions are and and then even more so as Chester said to be able to start infusing some of what we're passionate about into the work that we do every day so if you were one of those folks on this call that answered the question when was the last time you were really excited about your work and it wasn't currently excited then there's probably some things that you can do and in some cases maybe that is finding a new job or profession or career but it's not something we necessarily advocate for but We've seen time and time again people just with small little tweaks in the way they sculpt their job can can make a big difference and, and lead to, to some really great results. So with that, that's that's our, our side of the story, but we're, uh, we're open to take uh, some questions here if anybody has some. If you'd like to reach out to Chester directly, he's a LinkedIn influencer, and uh, his number one motivator is friendship. So there's a good chance that if you email him, you'll probably get an invite to dinner. So um, I'm, I'm not kidding, but uh, uh, he definitely practices what he preaches here in terms of rewarding and recognizing and, and, and helping people to find their passion. So with that, I'll turn this back over to, uh, to, the, to the audience here. If there's any questions that we can answer, I'll be happy to tee those up um, for the remaining few minutes that we have. And um, uh, there is a great one that came in, Chester. Um, we get asked this quite a bit is so do, you know, do, do motivators keep changing in every person in his or her lifetime do they change do they change over time we get asked that question quite a bit um, sure you're welcome to take a crack at it I can I can chime in as well but go ahead yeah no it's interesting we found that over time there were some motivators that did change and some that didn't um, if you had family as a very high motivator that tended to stay very high it was interesting that um, uh, variety uh, tended to change over time for some people, you know, that, that you wanted more variety later in your career recognition. You know, one of the downloads is our white paper, and we do address that in the, in the white paper. One of the questions that popped up that I want to make sure we, we get to is, how do you deal with the specific negative person in the office? That, that's always a tough one, right? You've got a great team, but there's that one person that's just so negative and driving everybody crazy. I think in those situations, you've really got to sit down with them and talk about it and see what, what is it that's causing you to be so negative all the time. Let them know what the repercussions of that negativity is and try to work it out. Because I'll tell you, um, sometimes we say, well, we've got to work around people or that particular person is negative, but he's very you know, productive or the clients really like him. I'll tell you what, life is too short. If you've got somebody that's really bogging down the team and really bringing down the energy level, you got to have some serious conversations with them. And my advice is, if you can't turn that person around in a fairly short period of time, you got to think about what's the expression, my favorite, making them available to the marketplace. Uh, and what you'll find is that when you remove that negativity from your team, productivity will skyrocket, no question. One other comment. Um, somebody said, look, when you get your name etched on Lord Stanley's Cup, it doesn't make you exactly immortal. I would disagree. You get your name on Lord Stanley's Cup, you are immortal. <laughs> that's the greatest thing that could ever happen uh, to any hockey player that's ever lived. Um, but I know we're up against the time. So um, is there anything that we need to, um, to wrap up as far as the accountant's world? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, and just take back ownership here for a minute. And and if anyone has any additional questions, um, I see a couple questions have come in there. I'll just finish with my closing slide, but we can keep those questions going. And you see Chester's email address there, Chester at thecultureworks.com. Um, so I'm just going to bring it back here. Yeah, for while one you're second. bringing that back, I was, I was just going to say if we didn't get a chance to get to your question, you can email us or you can reach out to us at uh, go to thecultureworks.com. We're happy to answer any questions about anything that we've talked about today for sure.
Hi, is everyone else still there? You, you know, I, I got kicked out. Can you hear me? This is Chester. Uh, yep, I got, I got kicked out too. Must have had a, uh, an audio difficulty of some sort there uh, or a system difficulty with GoToWebinar. So um, I apologize for that. Um, I'm not sure exactly what happened there, but let me go ahead and, um, and go through my closing slide. And then if there are any other questions uh, that come in on the questions panel, we can go through those as well. Um, so I just wanted to again thank everyone for attending and thank you to Chester for joining us today for a really Josh, Hi, can I... Yeah, there we go. Some technical problems here, but listen, yeah. it was a I keep pleasure for me to be with Audio. you guys. Call me anytime. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you, Chester, for, for your time today. Um, I mentioned before the value building webinar that we're presenting here at Accountants World as well. We have one coming up on June 23rd. That's two days from now on Friday. Another one next Thursday on June 29th. And you can sign up at, at accountantsworld.com. Just scroll down the page a little bit and you'll see value building on there for that. Um, and once again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. When the webinar closes, you'll see a post-webinar survey and you can go ahead and fill that out to make sure that you receive CP credit. If you don't see the survey when you close out, no worries. You'll receive an email uh, from Accountants World afterwards, and there will be a link in that email to the post-webinar survey as well. Um, so once again, thanks to both of you for uh, joining us today and for your time. And uh, the feedback uh, and the questions that have come in have been, have been really interesting and, and good. So um, thank you again for, for presenting today. You bet. Take care. Hopefully there's some good things to help there and uh, have a great day and enjoy the weekend when you get there. <laughs>